Okay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Just to set the context, oh, I'm down to 25 minutes, okay. Just to set the context <laughs> to this, um, we've been gearing up for single animal instance predominantly. Our teams are based around the number of people needed to sort out the cow in the slurry pit, the horse in the trailer. Uh, and what we started thinking about was what happens with these larger scale multi-agency joined up situations. Uh, are we prepared? Have we got the right um, um, planning and resources in place to deal with them? And uh, one of the key jobs was this one here uh, where a cattle lorry was hit on a viaduct and there was a chemical tanker and fatalities and it spun round 360, took out the armco, cattle were flying out over the viaduct and crashing to their deaths below. Very difficult scenario to deal with, took them about 12, 15 hours to resolve and we've got to think are we doing the very best for animal welfare by having a situation that continues for that length of time. So I carried out a project, you lost your orange mate? <laughs> Carried out a project over a 12 month period, I went and spoke to drovers, I spoke to hauliers, I spoke to people that made these vehicles, I spoke to all the people that we felt would be required to be at one of these incidents and uh, we came up with a training DVD and that DVD, I've got a limited number of copies so any of the major rescue organisations that um, would like that please see me afterwards. Uh, you can rip it off, you can copy it, you can you know, let people have it, it's about getting people to start thinking about roles and responsibilities, thinking about priorities, thinking about how we can set the scene in order to um, carry out that rescue in the most um, efficient time. And uh, this picture here is actually taken from uh, a rescue that I had uh, in July this year, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Initial considerations, I mean, people get focused on, oh, animals in danger, we better let the door out, let the door open and get them out. I think we talked on maybe Friday, I think I maybe mentioned yesterday about the hazmat scenario. You know, these are hazmat jobs to us as emergency responders. And if we keep our hazmat in the box until we're ready to bring it out and we're set up, then that is going to be the safest for the public. So we need to tailor that with, uh, with the animal welfare as well. But if you look at this scene, this is just a small trailer that's gone over an armco barrier. Um, of course, the traffic's going to pile up. What are people going to do when they're sat in traffic on a warm day? What are they going to do? Get out. They're all going to get out. So when we're approaching this scene, any responder needs to understand the implications of animals that are loose, animals that are trapped, people's uh, reactions to animals when they're in danger. So people are all going to get out. First thing I want to do is get everyone back in the cars. Uh, people in the cars because that's the safest place for them. If you've got loose animals, particularly ones that are injured, they are a threat, they are a hazard and uh, must be considered as so. What do we do as emergency responders when there's lots of traffic? We rock up all guns blazing, sirens, lights, bullhorns. We all love all that. That's great. <laughs> but we've got to think about how that's affecting the scene. If it's a mile away, half a mile away, 300 metres away. You know. So what we don't want to do is turn up and make the situation worse. So we need all our responders, whether the highways agency, the police, the ambulance, fire brigade, whoever it might be, they need to think about their approach to the scene not crowding the scene, not all getting in amongst it, because we've got to think about, we're going to need hauliers to come in later. We're going to need a bit of space around this situation. If we've got loose animals, we don't want to put them under pressure. So we want to be very clear about setting this scene before we even think about rescuing any animals um, and looking ahead at what we might need later on in this situation. We've also got to think about the human uh, side of things versus animals. Because humans, of course, are going to be prioritised. They're going to come first. Here we've got a lorry full of sheep. And we've got numerous cars all wanged into it. So there's probably going to have to be a sectorisation of this incident, rescue of human casualties, or it could be one sector, and then we're going to think about animal rescue. And we may have to resource the animal rescue side of that totally separately from the resources we need to cope with the human injuries. And then we also, of course, we need to tailor that. Well, we can't start simultaneous activity rescuing animals, which is highly dangerous and potential problem to everyone else around them, when we've still got human casualties in the, in the mix. So whilst we need to be planning and preparing, we've got to deal with the humans first. That's quite difficult. 
Roles and Responsibilities with a DVD was designed to highlight to all the different people that are going to be there what are their roles and responsibilities. And of course, on the Fire and Rescue Service, we're going to be doing scene management, we're going to be providing rescue capability, uh, we're going to be providing incident command, we're going to be coordinating this whole activity. The police and the highways agency, they're going to be securing public safety, you know, we're getting those people back in their cars, they're going to be trying to turn those cars around and get them away because we know this scenario is going to be there for quite some time. It's not as if we can just clear it up and move them on by, get them turned around, get some access for those big haulage lorries that are now going to be coming into it. Uh, they're going to be thinking about other livestock vehicles that might be in the traffic jam leading up to it. What if you've got that big lorry full of pigs? that it's now cooking because you've got no real ventilation because it stood still on the tarmac, especially where you guys come from. Um, the vets, generally, we, we can get on our directory, can we have a vet to the scene? It's no good just having one vet, a livestock transporter incident. There's shed loads of work to do. There's triage, there's euthanasia, there's setting up I mean, triage areas outside, there's dealing with the animals that are inside the vehicle, there's the animals that have been loaded and are going to their, destined, their safe refuge, they need to be looked at when they get the other end. So there's all sorts of jobs for vets to do and, um, uh, and they also need to think about the resources because most vets, if we're talking about the job in a minute, when we've got to sedate ten horses, most vets wouldn't carry the sufficient amount of uh, drugs to be able to cope with that sort of scenario. And maybe the euthanasia drugs that they might need to cope with that scenario. So they need to be getting onto the practice and resourcing it properly. And then those people need to be escorted to the scene because now they're turning up in their little car and they're meeting this ten mile traffic jam. Police, highways agency, if they're all at the scene and they're just, you know, they're under-resourced, they're not able to get the very people that we need to the scene of the accident. And I've waited ages for a trailer to arrive and the, and the um, police officer says, oh, well, we haven't got the resources to escort it here. I said, well, we're going to be here a very long time then, mucker. You know, you, you need to sort it out because if they don't get here, we're not doing the job. Other people that are involved, haulers, we need to get there. Um, animal health inspectors in, in the UK we would have at that situation. That's from a legal perspective quite often. If we've got cattle loose and we just chuck them into a farmer's field, we immediately shut that farm down for six days, put them under a movement restriction. If those animals are going from, a, you know, they, they've been in, um, bought and then they're going to uh, market or slaughter, they might not have been TB tested. In our country, that's a massive issue. So if you introduce that onto someone's land and you've got a disease implications, God, blimey, you know, the, the knock-on effect of that could be quite high. So if we want to have containment systems and, and um, races and things to set up to perform our triage, the animal health local inspectors will know which farmers can provide us with those handling facilities. So they're really important to be there. NACA men, you know, most of these instances you're not going to have the, um, the drugs to euthanase, they're going to be doing it uh, using captive bolt or firearm, normally captive bolt in these situations. Um, <clears throat> The media also can play a part, you know, because most of the time, you know, the media can be a pain in the neck. But if they can get on there and say, we've got livestock in difficulty, please don't, don't use that road as big, you know, all that rest of it. Also, you think about matrix signs. Don't know if you, you must have them over on your motorways, you know, in big matrix signs to say if there's an accident ahead. Well, let's put up a sign saying, animals trapped, please pass quietly and slowly. Because you'll get people going by the scene, all they see is a lorry turned over. They don't know there's animals in there and they're horning and threatening you because you're keeping the road shut and all this sort of rubbish. Yeah, it happens all the time. So pre-planning, which is what we've tried to do, enables us to have a casualty-centred rescue. So we're not panicking we can't, you know, because we don't know how to deal with it. We're actually thinking about the casualties. We're considering the time uh, that those casualties are going to be in that vehicle and depending on whether it's a cattle lorry or, or a sheep or a pig lorry, you know, if you think about the, the, the section that your cattle stand in, uh, that compartment is going to be as tall probably as it is wide. So if it rolls over, they've got loads of space and they can probably stand up unless they're incapacitated. You now think about sheep or pigs, and we have four decks of those, and the decks are only about that high. And of course, you turn that over and now you've just got a big column of sheep or pigs. And now there's a massive impact because they are gonna, they're going to be the ones that die very, very quickly. Um, we need to think about the anxiety of the animals that are in there because that will determine how we're going to approach it and what control measures we need. We need to think about our ultimate safe refuge. The safe refuge mean, might mean we get them out, we corral them, we contain them. We might contain them in a field, might contain them on the road. Safe refuge might be we've got to get them on the truck and away. So there could be several stages of safe refuge that we need to consider. And the welfare, obviously, of those animals is so important. So here's the, uh, the case study, and we've just done this whole DVD, and uh, then suddenly the, the job happened that we were dreading. Um, this is um, one of the UK's top polo uh, teams, 
and they were being transported to an event. Uh, they're in a rigid lorry, and there's, well, there was conflicting stories as to how many were on board. It went from two to six to, to 11 to 10. There was 10 in the end, but no one really knew how many were on board. That's the people that were traveling them, for goodness sake. You know, so again, pre-planning. Um, so the initial call was to uh, road traffic collision involving two heavy goods vehicles. Both drivers were trapped at the time. When they got there, uh, they realized that there was animals and they rolled an animal rescue specialist, which was myself. Uh, and once I ascertained the nature of the job, I rolled the animal rescue team and two other of my colleagues who are animal rescue specialists as well. Uh, this was the uh, articulated lorry that hit the rigid lorry. So the, the lorry had pulled over because he'd got a locker loose. He'd gone back out onto the, uh, onto the carriageway and he was, there was no hard shoulder. And this other lorry driver, we don't know the exact nature of um, what happened, but he's hit him really hard, shoved him about 100 yards into that um, bridge pillar there and it's rolled over. So we've got a rolled over lorry with 10 horses on board. And at this point, you can see we've got ambulance teams, we've got fire and rescue, we've got police, they're all there, they're all over this thing. When I got there, there was people on the top of here all peering in the, in the windows. All right, everybody off. Uh, and as I arrived, they just sorted out the humans. They just got the, uh, the casualties out of the vehicles and, uh, and off to hospital. So uh, the vet turned up alongside me, this guy here, Chris, and he's been on one of our courses. So we were immediately on the same page, which is absolutely fantastic, especially when you've got a job like that. Um, so what are we going to talk to him about? Well, these are all the, the areas that I was talking to him about prior to us actually getting to work. Well, what, what have we got on board? What's our, what were they carrying? Because it doesn't come with any you know, codes or, or consignment details. You know, if you've got a cattle lorry that's gone over, there'll be consignment details that'll tell you exactly what's on board. You can trace that back because they've all got ear tags and you can get onto trading standards and they can go on the database and tell you what farm they came from and all the history. Horses, it's much more difficult. Um, so how many are on there, what's the sex of those animals, you know, all these things which were going to give me my hazmat information to help me take, uh, get my plan. What access have we got for those animals immediately? Well, the only access we had, other than opening the back door, which I wouldn't let them do, was, of course, on polo lorries have got windows on the tops. So, of course, it's gone over on its side and now they're presenting on the top there. Big problem for this job was, I mean, Rebecca was talking about ventilation, when I got up on there and looked in, the heat just smacked me in the face. So you've got a tin box, which has got very little ventilation now because it's not driving along. It's on a tarmac road on a hot day. Well, hot in our language. You know. <laughs> <coughs> it's probably about 16. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. It was about 25, so it was a warm day in England. Um, but the stress of those animals as well contributes to this absolute massive heat that was coming out. Can we triage those animals? Whew, difficult. You know, all we could do was peer in and have a look the best we could. There was I mean, snap fetlocks in there. There was, I mean, we were talking earlier about, um, Josh was talking about the, the horse with the sort of snap leg. You know, it was, there was horses in there with snap legs, front and rear, paddling around in the partitions and all sorts of stuff. Um, what are the conditions on board? What are we considering as our chemical control regime? How are we going to administer chemical control without going in there and doing it? Um, What's the availability of drugs? Has he got enough? Does he need to get more? And the time scale for extra veterinary resources, and of course the police at that scene, you know, as I said before, would need to facilitate them getting to the, to the scene of the uh, job. What's the expected levels of stimulation? How are we going to cut into it? How are we going to extricate them? What's that going to do to the anxiety levels of the animals that are in there? That was quite important. The nearest equine referral hospital. You know, so, and one of the questions I asked half an hour into the job to the bloke that was responsible for these animals, right, when they come out, where are they going? And he said, what do you mean? Well, we'll put them in the lorry and we'll take them home. I said, no, you don't understand, mate. There's lacerations all over them. There's snap legs. There's all sorts going on in there. All of them need to go to a referral hospital. Or, you know, they might need to be split up because one hospital might be, not be able to cope with that number coming in. Have you thought about that? No. He said, oh, no, you almost went white. You know, and I thought, wouldn't that be your natural reaction to decide where they were going to go? But no, he hadn't thought about it. Uh, how are we going to transfer them to hospital? What facilities have we got for that? Uh, and what's our preferred external triage and treatment area and how are we going to set that up? So lots of stuff w was being discussed in a very short amount of time uh, before we could even get going. So decided that we're going to sedate them sequentially in the back of the lorry. Yeah, it sounds easy, right? But we need to do that intramuscularly because you can't go IV. So what I was explained to them was how to make an improvised remote injection pole. So on our fire engines, we've got these collapsible handles, 
Jafco handles that we have so that we can get more handles in a little space because you slot them all together. So um, here the vets are duct taping a syringe to the end of one of them. So you've got two long poles and then you have to get up on the truck there and lean in. And one jabs it in its backside, the other one pushes the plunger with another long pole. Uh, and they were having to do that all the way through. That's trauma care, that's, that's out of the box stuff, you know. I allocated, here they are, on the top of the vehicle now, sequentially sedating, and they actually euthanized the one that had the snap fet ox. The trouble was, he was that, that horse was over the back there, so it was very difficult to see and to get in there. And I said, how, how are you going to um, euthanize it? He said, oh, leave it with me. Anyway, they managed to use a barbiturate overdose through the chest cavity using a long pole. And, you know, outside the box stuff, literally. Um, then I, saw, I thought, well, hang on, you've got all these horses in there that are rotating around and jumping around all over the place. Um, we need to keep, keep track of this. So I put a firefighter whose job was command support. I said, get a pen and paper, stick with this vet here, and write down everything he tells you to. All right, when you sedate it, take the time, note how much you've given it, note the horse you gave it to, and then be prepared so that you can evaluate, and when you, go, you need to go back and top it up, you know which one to do. Trouble was, there was one Rowan, and the rest of them were all bay. <laughs> so as an outcome, what we need? We need to have some form of identification. Yeah. So, head collars, they put, later on, when they'd come out and they were triaging them, they were putting duct tape on the head collars and writing on the duct tape what they'd given them. You know, just like the vets at the Olympics had to write it down on a sheet, well, this was, this was again improvising, put some duct tape on there and write on it. And then when it got to the referral hospital, they'd know. Set up an equipment dump of our rescue vehicle and then lots of things were starting to happen then. So here we've got our fire crew, the, the guys that are there to do the actual extrication, uh, not the animal rescue crew, these were the special equipment unit boys. So we're confirming with them, well, what's the construction of the lorry? Because I, I know, because I've done all this research. Um, how are we going to get those animals out? What cutting equipment are going to be required for it? Um, talking to them about the limitations of sedation. How stimulating is this gear and, and what's the limitations? Because as we've, we've talked about before, a sedation is not just sedation. Most firemen would think, oh, you're sedated, it's fine. Uh, and uh, we need to tell them what our plan is, ultimately. So over here is a multi-agency briefing going on. And the way that we brief people is we talk about what's the situation, what are the risks, What's the plan and what resources do we need to, to do that? And that's a very simple way of working through that. And everyone was given a briefing. I'm talking to the police, the ambulance, everybody, about what I need and what's going to happen so they can visualise it. Because at the moment, all they can see is a tin box and lots of banging and crashing going on. We're at this stage now, and what you've got here is we've got our fire and rescue service making a containment plan. So this vehicle's being brought in to, to cover that gap. And then we've got... Um, in, temporary fencing that we're going to put up and we're going to create a, a funnel effect so we've got a triage area and then loading area. We've got the vets here, we've got three vets and a vet student and they're all now coming up with their triage and treatment plan so they've done their sedation and now we're ready to go and now they're going to come up with their plan for when these animals start to come out and the police are in the background creating their diversion plan and removing all the standing lock vehicles that were in the traffic jam uh, and it's quite difficult when you've got big, big lorries and sometimes you can't move them but uh, uh, they were doing the best they could and bringing the other vehicles in ready for transportation and I'm briefing the receiving hospital and saying hello my dear, um, are, you, are you aware of what's happening here? Well, she hadn't been given enough information I said right, have you had your tea? Have your tea now because in about 20 minutes, half an hour you're going to have a lot of work on your hands and um, this was in the afternoon, they were there till 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning sewing animals up I had time to update the TV though, that was all right. Just, uh, <laughs> this was Beth from Real Rescues, the TV um, film crew that were there, just talking about what's going on. Vehicles come. Now, at the end, I'm going to talk about, well, they, they got two big vehicles, and that actually wasn't necessarily the right thing to do. Um, but we're getting our vehicles in place. And, uh, you know, talking about transportation, you know, look at the ramp angles that we've got here. If you've got injured horses, you know, that's why uh, the horse ambulances that Josh was talking about was, uh, you know, something to consider. Uh, this is getting our temporary fencing now. I've, uh, as a result of the project, I want to get hard, you know, proper cattle races. I'm going to get a trailer with a, with a full set on so I can bring it out to the job. We improvised with this containment roll that we use. Uh, it's a bit of a visual barrier, but um, we just needed to keep control of it. Inside, you can see that there's partitions over the, all over the place. Horses are wrapped up in them. Some have collapsed. Some are still standing. 
we got horses under partitions with horses stood on other horses. It was quite a chaotic scene. The stock gates, as we'll all be familiar with, were on the floor. I think that's where the horses got their snap fetlocks. Um, there was horses with their, with their hooves stuck through, through there. Um, quite messy. Uh, that was the, the photo that Josh showed earlier. Uh, you can see how steamy it is in there. You know, that's how it was, it was, it was very humid. Lots of lacerations. It looked really quite nasty. Uh, just getting ready to go, we're starting to open the door. I'm up here, it's my backside looking in to be able to confirm what's going on inside there. And we've got guys here, this is a scaff pack. Any of you rescue boys will, will probably know of that. It's a hook which you put on a telescopic um, pole and you can just get it on the head collar, retract it and it leaves it there. And Rebecca and Thomas use a, a different version of that, but that's, that's what we've um, used. It worked a treat, really good, because you've got to reach over dead animals to get hold of a live one and then reach in from the top and cut the, the sacrificial string that was holding it up. Um, this is... Yeah, but I'm on this clock, Sonia. It's going, I'm flipping, stop the clock. <laughs> <coughs> here we've got uh, horses coming out, so we've made a, a, a hole here. They're coming out, we've got um, rescue glide auxiliary sheets here. There's uh, a bit more containment. Um, of course, that then requires people to be stood behind them, so we've got to balance that risk. Would have a set of um, stock races been better? Yes, probably. The, the more people you can get out of this scene, the better. Uh, and then they come into the treatment area where these, these vets is, is a vet, and that's a vet who was um, doing that triage. Vets with helmets on. That sits in my animal rescue vehicle, that sits in my truck. Right, so we provided helmets, they didn't have their own helmets. In fact, one of them did, and he's the one that, he was the one that had been on the course. He had everything. You know, he had conspicuity, he had bump hat, the whole bit. Uh, it's not very clear, well that one's a little bit clearer, but this is as we're moving through the vehicle. So these horses have been sedated and we were just basically taking dead horses out on rescue glides. We were taking debris out and we were putting the rubber mats that were all over the place on the ground to make it easier for them to come out. Uh, this was just one of the, the dead ones that was being whipped out quickly. Uh, this is the, one of the first ones that came out. And here we've got now our grooms, I and mean, that was a, a slight complication because they were Argentinian and South African, their English was very poor, but they were the grooms for this polo team and they wanted to do everything, and I had to be quite firm with them that, yes, once we got the animals out, they could then take over and load if they behaved themselves, and I only wanted to have the ones doing that that could communicate in English properly. Um, but they, in the early stages, as this is our animals, will be going in there to get them out. Yeah, and this is quite a common thing, and we needed to be quite firm with that. So, key areas of knowledge that we require to deal with these situations, I think, is well, we need to know about species behavioural characteristics. That's quite an, that's a very important thing, uh, and options for containment because different animals will require different containment measures, right, and different haulage me measures. So, we need to be very clear about what we're dealing with, the hazard we're dealing with, before we actually start asking for these things to come along. We need to understand vehicle design and we need to understand how to extricate animals and the DVDs are um, very good at sort of highlighting some of those areas. We need to understand everybody's roles and everyone's priorities so that we can understand how everyone's going to be working and we need someone to coordinate it as well. We need to understand the legal responsibilities and implications of our actions and we need to have a good list of people that can, right, because we're not going to be experts at everything. We need to know who we can call to help us out. Learning points from that job, ventilation, and I'm looking now at um, a, a small fan, electric fan, with a um, uh, with ducting that we could have fed into that vehicle, which we could have started to circulate that air. That would have helped us if we'd had one of them, so that would be going on my truck. Smaller transporters. From the time we opened the door, the time we got 10 horse out, that was an hour, which isn't bad, really, considering what we had. But the horse that came out first was triaged and loaded. That was sat on that lorry for an hour, cooking. Right? So, in human terms, the more casualties we have, the more ambulances we have. And I've got a 24-hour number I can ask to get um, local haulage contractors and horse taxis to the scene of an incident very quickly. What I should have done was got onto PRP Rescue and said, I want 10, out, 10 horse taxis or, or 10 light vehicles, and it's one out, load it, go. Or two out, load two, loading two is better. Going, going in pairs is better. Um, remote injection poles, we've got one that we're making at the moment, it's in the hands of a manufacturer which would have assisted us greatly at this job without having to improvise on the day. The handling system that we've already talked about, 
the matrix messages for the members of the public because they were driving by when we still had the road open, hooting and carrying on, and also sectorisation, veterinaries, se functional sector for the veterinary side of things, and then the fire and rescue, rescue side of things, and the triage side of things, and that, that would have worked better. But that's about a joined up approach. I've got about tw 12 seconds left. Nine, eight, <laughs> seven. So that is an absolute whistle-stop tour of, uh, of livestock <coughs> transportation incidents. Um, they're a major headache. They have wide-ranging implications and uh, something that all rescue teams should, uh, should be considering. And the most important thing is to think about the network of resources that you need to deal with it and to make contact with those people and to get... Um, mechanisms in place to get those people to the scene of that job. Thank you very much.